Chapter Twenty Five His Way is on the Sea. Part One There was a family council at Silverbush when school opened in September. It was decreed that Pat must join the entrance class and prepare herself for the Queen's Academy examinations the next year. Pat protested, but Father was inexorable. He had let Winnie off, realizing that Winnie's golden curls thatched a brain that could never be wrought to distinguish between a participle and an infinitive. But Pat's record in school, although never brilliant, had been above the average, so to Queen's she must go and study for a teacher's license. "'You'll get the North School, and board at home,' said Dad, which was the only gleam of hope Pat saw in the whole dismal prospect. She flew to the kitchen and poured out her discontent and rebellion to Judy. "'Oh, oh, and don't you want to be educated, Patsy Dadland? To be educated was all right, but to go away from home was all wrong. "'I don't seem to be like other girls, Judy. They all want to go to college and have a career.' I don't. I just want to stay at Silverbush and help you and Mother. There's work for me here, Judy. You know there is. Mother isn't strong. As for being educated, I shall be well educated. Love educates, Judy. Oh, oh, and you're not so far out there, Galene. But there's many a thing to be considered besides. Money doesn't be grown on bushes, darling. What fun if it did, for a moment. Pat was sidetracked by a vision of little gold dollars hanging from the ends of branches like golden blossoms. Your dad isn't rich, and a family like this is expensive when they're grown up and not in the pretty clothes. You'll have to go get ready to help him out a bit until some of ye are married or gone away. I don't want any of us to get married or go away. You're a clean, unreasonable darling. Pat was beginning to suspect that she was unreasonable, that these things would have to be faced sometime. For instance, Winnie had a bow. Not bows. She had had bows for over a year, and Pat had grown used to their coming and going and Winnie's resultant chatter about dates. But a uh, bow. Frank Russell, of the Bayshore Russells, seemed to have scattered all the others, and Winnie was beginning to blush painfully when Joe teased her about him. Pat hated Frank so bitterly that she could hardly be civil to him. Judy got quite out of patience with her. You ought to be having a little bit of sense, Pat. Young Frank is be way of having a real good match. The Russells do be all knowing how to make one hand wash the other, and only son and his mother did, and all the Bayshore girls trying to nab him. When he'd just be stepping into that grand old Russell place at the Bayshore and be quain, with never a mother in law to look back like she moved to Sophie, and that near home and all. When he's too young to think of being married, protested Pat. Sure, and the darlint is eighteen. There's no question of being married yet a while. She must have her court in time as is proper, but the rustle always means business, and young Frank has the glint in his eye. I'm telling you, he knows whether to be coming for a good wife. He isn't very intelligent, snapped Pat. Will you listen at her? He ain't much for radiating poetry or building fancy houses like a jingle, I'm supposing, but he's got a real grip on politics, as long Alec was quick to see, and I'm clean missing me guess if he don't be in Parliament by the time he's a bit bald. You're not needing any great intelligence for that. Winnie's no real scholar herself, the darlint, but there isn't the like of her for the light biscuit of the island. She'll be the grand housekeeper of that fine house, I'm telling you. Pat didn't want telling. The thought of Winnie ever leaving home, no matter how long the courting days were, remained intolerable. She continued to hate Frank, but she resigned herself to the entrance class and even took up the work with a certain grim determination to do well for the sake of Silverbush. She knew people thought the Silverbush family was lacking in ambition. Joe had stubbornly refused to go to school after he was fifteen. Winnie had always been dumb when it came to lessons. Sid was determined to know farming and nothing else, so it was up to her to re-establish the gardener credit in the halls of learning. I'm so thankful Bets is in the entrance class, too, Judy. I was afraid for a long while she couldn't be. Her father thought she wasn't strong enough, but 
Beck's coaxed so hard he has given in. If Betts is with me when I go to Queen's, it won't be so bad, supposing I ever get there. Supposing, is it? Sure, and there isn't much doubt, but you'll get there. Clever and all as you are when you give your mind to it. Which, I watch you working out them queer algebra things, it makes me hate having wheels in my head. As for your geometry stuff, Gentleman Tom himself couldn't be seeing through it. Geometry is my favorite class, Judy. Bets doesn't like it, but she loves everything else that I love. We have planned to study together each night about all through winter. We'll study hard for two hours, and then we'll talk. I believe ya. The little tongues of ya do be always clucking. Yes, but Judy, there are times when we don't talk at all. We just sit and think. Sometimes we don't even think. We just sit. It's enough just to be together. And oh, Judy, Bets and I... I did be hearing you was calling each other Elizabeth and Patricia. Pats laughed. We did try to, but it didn't work. Elizabeth and Patricia sounded like strangers. We didn't know ourselves. As I was saying, Bets and I have begun to read the Bible right through. We're not going to skip a single chapter, not even those awful names in Chronicles. You've no idea how interesting the Bible is, Judy, when you read it just as a story. Oh, oh, haven't I now? Sure, and wasn't I read in my Bible afore you were born or thought of? But I did be skipping the names. There was too many jawbreakers among them for me. I do be wondering if there never was any nicknames in them days. Do you think now, Patsy dear, that every time Jessophat's mother called to him to his little dinner, she said his whole name? Part 2. The Autumn Drifted By Maple fires were kindled around the secret field. Bracken and Lady Fern turned down in happiness. Jordan ran to the sea between borders of purple asters. Golden harvest moons looked down over the hill of the mist. A gracious September and a mellow October were succeeded by a soft and sad November, when long silken lines of rain slanted across the sere hillsides. And then one day, Without any warning, came the first break in the family at Silverbush. They had all, except Joe, been spending Saturday afternoon and evening at the Bayshore farm, where nothing had changed in Pat's remembrance. It was a world where all things seemed the same. There was beginning to love the Bayshore for that very changelessness. It seemed the one place you could depend on a changing world. Aunt Frances and Aunt Honor were just as stately as ever, though they had given up asking her to say Bible verses and tapping her on the head when they disapproved of her. They still disapproved of her in many things, but Pat liked even the disapproval because anything else would have been change. Cousin Danny still wore his elvish grin. The great-great was still alive at ninety-eight, and not a day older, apparently, nor any more complimentary. Every time she saw Pat, she said, Nay, beauty, in the same peevish tone, as if Pat were entirely to blame for it. The vase that had made the face at Sarah Jenkins still stood in the same bracket, and the polished doorknobs still brightly reflected your face. The white ivory elephants had never finished marching across the mantel, and the red and yellow china hen had evidently never succeeded in hatching out her eggs. Betts was with them, and this added to the pleasure of the day. It was such fun to show Betts everything. The ants liked her, but who could help liking Betts? Even the great-great peered at her with admiration in her bright old eyes, and for once forgot to tell Pat she was no beauty. When they came back to Silverbush, Pat must walk up the hill with Betts. It had turned colder and the first snowfall was whitening down over the twilight world when Pat came into the kitchen. At once she saw that something must be wrong, terribly wrong. Mother was looking as white as if she had been struck. Winnie was crying, and Judy, of all people, had been crying. Sid looked as if he were trying not to cry. Father stood by the table holding a letter in his hand. Snicklefritz sat by him, looking up with mute, imploring eyes. Gentleman Tom had an air of not liking things. Even bold and bad, whom ordinarily nothing could subdue, crouched with an apologetic air under the stove. Pat looked around, 
Everybody was there, except... Except? Where's Joe? she cried. For a moment, nobody spoke. Then Winnie sobbed. He's gone. Gone? Where? To sea. He went to the harbor tonight and sailed in Pierce Morgan's vessel for the West Indies. And me never suspect in it, the gomerin I am, wailed Judy. Not even when he came in, all queer-like, and said he would be taken a run to Silverbridge. Sure, and if I'd known what was in his head, I'd have hung on to him till after the tide set. That wouldn't have done any good, said Long Alec, rousing himself from his abstraction. He was bound to go sooner or later. I've known that for some time, but he was so young. And to go off like this without a word to one of us, it was cruel of him. There, there, Mary. For Mother had turned and buried her face on his shoulder with a little broken cry. Father led her out of the kitchen. Winnie and Cuddles followed. Sid went out, and Pat was weeping wildly in Judy's arms. Judy, I can't bear it, I can't bear it, Joe to go, and like that? Sure, do be cruel, as Long Alec said. The young fry do be cruel betimes. They don't know, they don't know. Now, don't be breaking your little heart, darling. Remember it's harder for your mother than for any of the rest of you. Joe'll be back sometime. But never to stay, Judy. Never to stay. Oh, I'll always hate this day, always. Oh, oh, don't be cynical now, said Judy, who picked up words as the children studied their lessons, but not always the exact meaning. Where's the sense of hating the poor day? You must be looking at this in the face. It's Wild Dick and your Uncle Horace all over again. Sure, and Joe had always been more like Horace than his own dad. He knew if he tried to say goodbye, Long Alec would be trying to put him off. Now, keep up your pecker, Patsy, for the sake of your mother. City's here to carry on, and it's the smart lad he is. His heart's in the farm, as Joe's never was, and he can have even drive the automobile, which the good man above never intended anybody to do. Joe's gone, but he hasn't taken Silverbush with him. Did you be after seeing the little note he left on Long Alec's desk? No, there was a message in it for you. Tell Pat to be good to Snicklebritz. And there was one for me, too. By way of a joke, Joe always had a joke the darlint. Tell Judy to see that those blamed kittens in her picture are grown up by the time I come back. Sure, and wasn't he always laughing at them same kittens? But Pat could not laugh again for a long time. She was the last one at Silverbush to resign herself to the inevitable. Eventually, she found herself doing it, with a sense of shame that it could be so. But the raw, rainy winter was half over before she ceased to have sleepless nights when it stormed, and began looking forward with pleasure to Joe's letters, with bewitching foreign stamps on them which Cuddles proudly collected. They were full of the glamour of strange ports and distant lands, of the lure of adventure and white-winged ships, to which Pat thrilled in spite of herself. Somehow, although she hadn't believed it possible, Silverbush got on without him. Sid had stepped manfully into his place. In truth, Sid was glad of an excuse to leave school. Mother began to smile again. Frank Russell consoled Winnie. Everybody ceased to listen for the gay whistle that had echoed so often through the twilights around the old barns. Even Snicklefritz stopped wearing a sorrowful cast of countenance and listened mournfully to every footstep on the stone walk. Change, and worse than change, forgetfulness. It seemed dreadful to Pat that things could be forgotten. Why, they were just as bad as the family at Silverbridge that had gone one son to California and one in Australia, one in India, and one in Petrograd, and didn't seem to mind it at all. Oh, oh, how could we be living if we didn't forget it, me jewel, said Judy. But Christmas was so terrible, sighed Pat. The first time we weren't all here, I couldn't help thinking of something I heard you say once, that once one of the family was away for Christmas, it was likely they would never be all together again. I just couldn't eat. And I didn't see how anyone else could. But you do be remembering how you slipped into the kitchen at bedtime and we had a feast on the bones, said Judy slyly. 
Part 3 Everything passes. Winter was spring before they knew it. Everybody was looking forward with delight to Joe's homecoming. March brought a saddening letter from him. He was not coming home in Pierce Morgan's vessel. He had shipped for a voyage to China. Well, that was a disappointment. But meanwhile, March was April, with sap astir and frogs turning up in the fields of the pool and all the apple boughs that had fallen in winter storms to be gathered up and burned sid and pat did that and they and betts and hilary had a glorious bonfire at night and after it was over pat couldn't walk home with betts because sid did pat didn't mind she was too happy because sid seemed to be having quite a crush on betts this spring he's all out with may binney judy won't it be lovely if he marries betts some day Oh, oh, go easy with their matchmaking," said Judy sarcastically. Besides, it was nice to sit with Hilary on Weeping Willie's tombstone, in the glow from the smouldering embers in the orchard, and talk about things. Pat had learned to call him Hilary. She was even beginning to think of him as Hilary, though in moments of excitement the old name popped out. Judy never could bring her tongue to call him anything else. To her he would always be Jingle. The Dowdlants, she would say to Gentleman Tom, looking out of her kitchen window at them. I do be wondering what's a for of them in life, and how much longer it is they have to be young and light-hearted. Gentleman Tom would not tell her. April was May, with a white fire of wild cherry and happiness, and young daffodils dancing all over the garden, and little green cones shooting up in the iris beds. Every day Pat made some new discovery. One forgets all through the year how lovely spring really is, and so it comes as a surprise every time, she said. And finally, May was June, with a fairy wild plum hanging out in the whispering lane, and purple waves of lilac breaking along the yard fence, and Judy's beds of white pansies all ablow. Big, white, velvety pansies. And everywhere, all the different shades of it green in the young spring woods on the hills. Spring is nicer at Silverbush than anywhere else, Judy. Just look what a lovely iris, frosty white with a ripple of blue fringing every petal. It's Joe's iris. He planted it last spring, and now where is he? On the other side of the world be like. Tell me, Patsy dear, do you be understanding how it is they don't fall off down there? I've never been able to get the hang of it into me mind somehow. Pat tried to explain, but Judy still shook her grey bob in a maze of uncertainty. Oh, oh, it's me own stupidity I'm knowing. No, it's my fault, Judy. I've a headache tonight. Sure, and it's studying too hard ye are, that algebra. Now, it's meself do be thinking it isn't fit for girls to be learning. Morning, noon, and night it is as ye are. I must study, Judy. The entrance comes in another month, and I must pass. Father and mother will feel dreadfully if I don't. I'm not afraid of the mathematics. I've always been fond of arithmetic especially. Only, do you remember how dreadfully sorry I used to be for poor A and B and C because they had to work so hard? D appeared to have things easier. Sure, and do, I do remember how pitiful you used to look up and say, Doesn't he ever have a holiday duty? It's the grand marks you'll be making in everything I'm expecting. No, I'm such a dub in history, Judy. I can't remember dates. Dates, is it? And who cares about dates? What difference does it make when things happen as long as they did happen? The examiners think it makes some difference, Judy. The only two dates I'm positively sure of are that Julius Caesar landed in Britain 55 B.C. and that the Battle of Waterloo was fought in 1815. Outside of those, everything is in a fog. Me own great-grandfather fell at the Battle of Waterloo, said Judy, and left me great-grandmother a widdy with nine small children. But what's a widdy more or less in the world now after the Great War? Do you be remembering anything of it, Pat? I was five when the armistice was signed. I remember the fireworks at the bridge, and, dimly, people talking of it before that. It seems like a dream. You never talk of it, Judy. 
Sure, and I was ashamed all through it because I had none of me own to go, and thankful that Siddy and Joe were children. Your mother and your Aunt Hazel and myself just knit socks for a soldiers and sat tight. It's a time I don't like to be thinking of, with everyone ranting at the Kaiser and your Uncle Tom and your dad moaning because they was too old to go, and us lying awake at night worrying for fear they'd find a loophole in spite of the family Bible. And yet all of us a bit ashamed in our hearts that we didn't have any maple leaves in the windies. Not but what there was a bit of fun about it, with all the girls that proud to be walking with the boys in khaki and your Uncle Tom singing a hymn of hate in the back yard at Sally Field every morning afore breakfast. Sure, and if I didn't hear him shouting, I'd rather die in the trenches than live under German rule. While I was milking, I'd be running over to see if he'd got lumbago. He was that excited when the election for the Union government was on. Sure, and I did be fearing he'd burst a blood vessel. When he found your Aunt Edith praying that it might go in, he was real indignant. Elections ain't won by prayers, says he, and he marched her down to vote, and her protesting all the way it was unwomanly. You never saw such a Tommy Shaw. Sandy Taylor at the Bayshore called his first by John Jellico Douglas Hague Lloyd George Bonner Law Kitchener. You should have seen the look of the minister when he was christened, and after it all the boys had just called him slats all his life, him being so thin. They did be saying that Ralph Morgan married Jane Fisher just to escape enlisting. Sure, and I'm no judge of things matrimonial, Patsy. I never pretended to be, but it did seem to me that I'd rather be facing the Kaiser and all his angels than a Mary Fisher. Maybe Ralph come round the same way of thinking. When we had the memorial service for the boys as had been killed, he heaves a big sigh and says to me, Ah, Judy, they're at peace, says he. Oh, oh, it's all over now, and I'm hoping the world will have more sense than ever to get in a mess like the same again. More be token that the women can be voting. Old Billy Smithson at Silverbridge doesn't agree with you, Judy. He says women are fools, and things will soon be in a worse mess than ever. Oh, oh, and are you thinking that possible now? said Judy sarcastically. Old Billy shouldn't be after judging all women by his own. Well, do I remember the first time I was ever voting? I wore me blue silk and me high heeled boots when I went to the polls, and I was that excited I could never tell where I put the cross on me ballot. From what I could explain to him, your dad always thought I put it in the wrong place. But anyway, me man went in, so it was no great matter if I did. I've never been voting since because it always happens I've been canning tomatoes or some special job like that whenever there's an election. Uncle Tom says everyone ought to exercise her franchise, that it's solemn duty. Listen at that. Don't be sound and fine. But would I be letting me tomatoes or me baked damson spoil because I have to traipse off to Silverbridge to be voting? Sure, Patsy dear, governments may go in, and governments may go out, but the jam pots at Silverbush do have to be filled, 